My name is Daniel Stark. I'm the program manager at the Missouri Onsite Safety and Health Consultation Service. And basically what we do is we're invited in by small businesses uh, throughout the state of Missouri to help them get in compliance with OSHA and not only help them get in compliance with OSHA, but hopefully develop a good safety and health management system. Uh, our service basically is, is designed for small employers, but uh, the kind of industries that we uh, go to um, are boundless. Uh, you know, we go to nursing homes, we go to uh, greenhouses, uh, John Deere dealerships, um, funeral homes, you know, all different, different types of businesses. And it's just a, a, a real uh, Thank you, Leslie. variety of different, um, uh, again, you know, industries that we can provide our services. Uh, but today we're going to concentrate on uh, probably one of the more perplexing uh, issues uh, going on right now. That's COVID-19 uh, workplace safeguards to reduce risk of COVID-19. COVID so what we're trying to do is uh, reduce the risks of, um, you, you know, employees coming back to work through this presentation. Uh, today's objectives include have a basic understanding of the Missouri on-site safety and health consultation program. Uh, we've been accused of being one of the best kept secrets in state government and we're out to uh, dispel that. So we want everybody to know um, about the services that we can provide and, and its many benefits. Uh, we wanna be familiar with the steps of an infectious disease preparedness plan. You know, any type of uh, emergency or um, any particular hazard that we're dealing with, we want to create some sort of a plan. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about the steps uh, businesses can take to reduce COVID-19 exposure. Uh, know what engineering and administrative controls that can be used to control COVID-19. And then finally, we'll be familiar with the OSHA requirements related to, to COVID-19. So, you know, as you try to mitigate some of these hazards with COVID-19, a lot of times it could inadvertently kick you into to some OSHA compliance issues, and we're going to talk about that. safety standards automatically became law and it put a pretty good burden on small employers to comply with these safety and health standards. So what OSHA did was they created a, a OSHA consultation program that's run through the states. Um, the actual standard or the federal law that talks about the OSHA consultation program is 29 CFR 1908. Um, in January 1978, Governor Teasdale signed an executive order establishing the consultation program in Missouri. And we started doing consultations um, about October 1, 1979. So we've been in existence since 1979. Uh, the program is 90% federally funded and 10% state funded. Uh, we require 90% of our federal or funds from federal OSHA. And then the state of Missouri matches uh, 10% of that. So each year I have to write a cooperative agreement uh, with OSHA on how many visits we're going to do, what types of industries we're going to try to target with, with consultation, and then they give me 90% uh, operating funds in the state of Missouri through the legislature um, 
provides us 10%, the remaining 10% funds to operate. With the program, there are, um, we, we basically conduct like an OSHA type mock inspection. And a lot of times that's what the employers are interested in having us come in and do. And there's really two main reasons uh, why I believe we can do a, a good OSHA type mock inspection. One is that um, we attend the same training as OSHA compliance officers do up in Chicago. So we sit shoulder to shoulder with compliance officers throughout the United St States and get trained on the same standards, the same uh, letters of interpretation, basically, you know, the, the same ways they enforce the standard as, you know, as the compliance officers do. Uh, the second reason I think we can provide a good OSHA type mock inspection is that they provide us copies of the citations that they're writing uh, throughout the state of Missouri, not only in Kansas City, but also St. Louis. So we can review these citations and kind of look for trends uh, where OSHA is spending more time or citing um, this particular issue more than others. And we can pass that information on to the employer. Um, with the program, there are no fines, penalties, or citations. OSHA enforcement does all of that. We do not do any of that. And as I mentioned earlier, with the, uh, the funding arrangement, the 9010 funding arrangement, we can provide consultation services to small employers at no cost. So the program is free to utilize. The program is also confidential. We don't tell anybody where we go, especially OSHA. And it's important that, that we have a, a dividing line between the consultation people and the enforcement people. We don't, we don't share any information to OSHA or for that matter anywhere else or to anybody else about where we go. The main obligation that an employer has when they participate in the consultation program is they have to correct the serious hazards that we identify while we're there or any imminent danger situations. In fact, the imminent danger situations have to be corrected before the consultant leaves. And for some reason, an employer refuses to correct a serious hazard or an imminent danger, then by law, we have to refer that employer back to um, the, the OSHA enforcement people. However, since we've been in existence since 1979, we've never had to do that. Um, and that's my knowledge, we've never had to do that. So we've got a really good track record of not um, making any referrals to OSHA. And uh, we really work with the employers to try to get all hazards uh, corrected appropriately and on time. So, and as we identify serious hazards, we, we give the uh, employer a certain time frame to correct those particular hazards. Usually it's about 30, 60 days, something like that. So, um, so if anybody is interested in, in learning more information about the consultation program, feel free to visit our website. It's at labor.mo.gov backslash onsite, onsite or uh, feel free to give us a call at 573-522-SAFE. In. Good afternoon and welcome to Workplace Safeguards to Reduce Risks of COVID-19, a webinar presented by MU Extension's Labor and Workforce Development Team as part of the Workforce Transitions Rally Series. My name is Leslie Fisher and I will be facilitating today. This webinar is one hour long covering robust content from the Missouri Department of Labor's on-site safety and health consultation program. All participants are muted for the duration of the presentation. Please submit your questions via the chat function to the right of the screen. Our presenter today is Daniel Stark, Assistant Director and Program Manager of the Missouri Department of Labor's On-Site Safety and Health Consultation Program. Daniel has served the Missouri Department of Labor in this capacity since 2007 and brings industry insight and a wealth of knowledge to us today gained through more than 20 years of experience working as an occupational safety and health consultant and industrial hygienist. We are honored to host you all today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Daniel. All right, thank you, Leslie. 
Um, again, you know, my name is Daniel Stark. I'm the program manager at the Missouri Onsite Safety and Health Consultation Service. And basically what we do is we're invited in by small businesses uh, throughout the state of Missouri to help them get in compliance with OSHA and not only help them get in compliance with OSHA, but hopefully develop a good safety and health management system. Uh, our service basically is, is designed for small employers, but uh, the kind of industries that we uh, go to um, are boundless. Uh, you know, we go to nursing homes, we go to uh, greenhouses, uh, John Deere dealerships, um, funeral homes, you know, all different, different types of businesses. And it's just a, a, a real uh, huge variety of different um, industries that we can provide our services. Uh, but today we're going to concentrate on uh, probably one of the more perplexing uh, issues uh, going on right now. That's COVID-19 uh, workplace safeguards to reduce risk of COVID-19. COVID so what we're trying to do is uh, reduce the risks of um, you, you know, employees coming back to work through this presentation. Uh, today's objectives include have a basic understanding of the Missouri on-site safety and health consultation program. Uh, we've been accused of being one of the best kept secrets in state government and we're out to uh, dispel that. So we want everybody to know um, about the services that we can provide and, and its many benefits. Uh, we want to be familiar with the steps of an infectious disease preparedness plan. You know, any type of uh, emergency or um, any particular hazard that we're dealing with, we want to create some sort of a plan. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about the steps uh, businesses can take to reduce COVID-19 exposure. Uh, know what engineering and administrative controls that can be used to control COVID-19. And then finally, we'll be familiar with the OSHA requirements related to, to COVID-19. So, you know, as you try to mitigate some of these hazards with COVID-19, a lot of times it could inadvertently kick you into to some OSHA compliance issues, and we're going to talk about that. So we're going to first spend a few slides just talking about the Missouri On-Site Safety and Health Consultation Service. Um, back in 1970, Richard Nixon signed into law the OSHA Act which reserved the right for employees throughout the United States to have a safe and helpful workplace. It's about 1975 that OSHA began to realize that a lot of small businesses throughout the United States was having a really hard time getting in compliance with, the, with these OSHA regulations because when he signed in a law, the OSHA Act, a lot of voluntary safety standards automatically became law and it put a pretty good burden on small employers to comply with these safety and health standards. So what OSHA did was they created a uh, OSHA consultation program that's run through the states. Um, the actual standard or the federal law that talks about the OSHA consultation program is 29 CFR 1908. Um, in January 1978, Governor Teasdale signed an executive order establishing the consultation program in Missouri. And we started doing consultations um, about October 1, 1979. So we've been in existence since 1979. Uh, the program is 90% federally funded and 10% state funded. Uh, we required 90% of our federal or our funds from federal OSHA. And then the state of Missouri matches 10% uh, of that. So each year I have to write a cooperative agreement uh, with OSHA on how many visits we're going to do, what types of industries we're going to try to target with with consultation, and then they give me 90% uh, operating funds in the state of Missouri through the legislature um, provides us 10%, the remaining 10% funds to operate. With the program, there are, um, we, we basically conduct like an OSHA type mock inspection. And a lot of times that's what the employers are interested in having us come in and do. And there's really two main reasons uh, why I believe we can do a, a good OSHA type mock inspection. One is that um, we attend the same training as the OSHA compliance officers do up in Chicago. So we sit shoulder to shoulder with compliance officers throughout the United St States and get trained on the same standards, the same uh, letters of interpretation, basically, you know, the, the same ways they enforce the standard 
as you know as the compliance officers do. Uh, the second reason I think we can provide a good OSHA type mock inspection is that they provide us copies of the citations that they're writing uh, throughout the state of Missouri, not only in Kansas City, but also St. Louis. So we can review these citations and kind of look for trends uh, where OSHA is spending more time or citing um, this particular issue more than others. And we can pass that information on to the employer. Um, with the program, there are no fines, penalties, or citations. OSHA enforcement does all of that. We do not do any of that. And as I mentioned earlier with the, uh, the funding arrangement, the 9010 funding arrangement, we can provide consultation services to small employers at no cost. So the program is free to utilize. The program is also confidential. We don't tell anybody where we go, especially OSHA. And it's important that, that we have a, a dividing line between the consultation people and the enforcement people. We don't, we don't share any information to OSHA or for that matter, anywhere else or to anybody else about where we go. The main obligation that an employer has when they participate in the consultation program is they have to correct the serious hazards that we identify while we're there or any imminent danger situations. In fact, the imminent danger situations have to be corrected before the consultant leaves. And for some reason, an employer refuses to correct a serious hazard or an imminent danger, then by, by law, we have to refer that employer back to um, the, the OSHA enforcement people. However, since we've been in existence since 1979, we've never had to do that. Um, and that's my knowledge, we've never had to do that. So we've got a really good track record of not um, making any referrals to OSHA. And uh, we really work with the employers to try to get all hazards uh, corrected appropriately and on time. So, and as we identify serious hazards, we, we give the uh, employer a certain time frame to correct those particular hazards. Usually it's about 30, 60 days, something like that. So, um, so if anybody is interested in, in learning more information about the consultation program, feel free to visit our website. It's at labor.mo.gov backslash onsite, onsite or uh, feel free to give us a call at 573-522-SAFE. All right, so that's a little bit about my program. I uh, wanna move on to the topic of the day, which is steps to reduce workers' risk of exposure to COVID-19. So, um, you know, this is one of the biggest things going on right now is, is COVID-19. Um, the CDC has put together um, and OSHA some guidance on this, but this is gonna be just a general overview of things that um, employers can do to reduce employers, employees' exposure uh, to COVID-19. However, there are some industry-specific uh, um, guidance that the CDC and OSHA has put together. And uh, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about that uh, here in a little bit. By now, a lot of us kind of already know uh, how COVID-19 spreads. Um, it basically spreads, you know, close person-to-person -person contact and, and close meaning, you know, less than uh, six feet away from each other, uh, from the other person through respiratory droplets, from coughing, sneezing and talking. And that's kind of been shown as the primary means of transmission. Another way you could possibly get it is through touching surfaces and then touching your mouth that's, that's content or touching contaminated surfaces then rubbing your mouth or nose or eyes. And that's not necessarily the primary way, it's a less, less common way, but it is a possible way um, that you can get it. And then also, um, asymptomatic, asymptomatic people, meaning people without symptoms, has also been shown that there's a possibility that they can spread the virus to others as well. So this is, again, this is the basic way that COVID-19 spreads um, in the community and, and in the workplace. All right, some of the factors that affect workers' risk of exposure to COVID-19, um, Basically, your distance between workers. Obviously, if you have uh, workers working closer together, there's going to be a higher probability of transmission. Okay. Also, if you have a longer duration of exposure with a particular person, if you're 
working with somebody really close over a period of eight hours, as opposed to just working with them for 30 minutes or, or an hour, that's going to affect the probability of transmission. Again, you're going if you're with that person, next to that person for a complete eight hours, that's going to affect your chances of transmission. And then also the type of contact. You know, we, we just covered that. You know, person to person contact or contact with a with a, a surface of some kind is going to affect um, your transmission. So what we basically do here is, or what I've done here is basically laid out a step-by-step -step, uh, procedure on things that we can do um, to get ready for COVID-19 if we're not already and to lessen our exposure to the virus. So um, the first thing we wanna do is develop an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. And we wanna be sure to make this specific to your workplace, okay? Um, a lot of times when we talk about response plans and, and just any type of written safety and health program, um, you know, you'll get it off the internet. And it'll be like a generic plan. Um, and that's not going to really going to do you any good. It has to be specific to your, to your workplace. Um, we also need to, or what needs to be included in this plan as well as where and how and what sources of COVID-19 might workers be exposed to. Okay, and we need to take into consideration, you know, is it the public? You know, how are we going to, how are we going to take care of the public coming in? Um, customers, coworkers, uh, what, how are we going to handle sick individuals that come into the work site? Uh, what are our, what is our procedures now for international travelers? If we have any international travelers, okay, that needs to be included. Those three things need to be included in our plan about how we're going to handle particular individuals. Uh, risk factors at home and in the community. Uh, risk factors also come into this this plan. Um, you know, if we're, you know, if you live or part of a huge family that lives in a small house, you know, th those are type of factors that's going to influence transmission. Or if you're in a type of community that's had an outbreak all of a sudden, you know, uh, that's going to affect what we need to do as far as decreasing the possibility of transmission. Uh, workers' individual risk factors. We got to take that into consideration too. You know, if we're a long or a long care company, where most of the workers that we that we hire and are working are twenty something uh, individuals in, in good health, you know, that's a little bit different scenario than you know if we have a different type of uh, company where the majority of our workforce is more at risk, you know, an older population. You know, those that's another factor that we have to look into um, and adjust accordingly. Uh, what controls are going to be necessary to address these risks? I'm going to get into controls a little bit, but controls can basically entail uh, engineering controls, uh, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. You know, what controls and what order are we going to address these risks? And then most of all, I think, you know, it's really important that you get employee input because they're the ones that are working every day on the lines, um, it's, it's important that you get their input and say, and, and, and hear their concerns about what they have. Uh, they'll give you a lot of really good feedback on, you know, where are the particular uh, issues that we could have a high likelihood of transmission or exposures, okay? And then also get union input, you know, maintain well, good communication with union and, and get their input on their, on their members' concerns. Okay, so all these items should be part of a preparedness and response plan. Step two involves developing procedures to identify sick workers. We need some sort of procedures in place. On what are we going to do with sick workers? Okay, so if um, an employee comes in or experiencing COVID type symptoms, you know, how are we going to handle those employees? Okay. Um, those types of employees also, or all employees, need to be um, trained on what to look for to self-monitor for any signs of symptoms, you know, whether they have shortness of breath, a cough, um, you know, body aches, fever, you know, all that sort of stuff. They need to know about those sort of symptoms to self-monitor for. And then also, you know, in, some employers may take advantage of temp agencies or contract workers, and if we're utilizing those types of 
of agencies, they need to be on the same page as what you're trying to do. Okay, so you don't, you know, you don't want to um, have all these things in place, and then your temp agency is basically doing nothing to help um, control COVID. So you need to be on the same page as far as how you're going to identify and deal with sick workers. Okay. All right, step three is basically how we're gonna implement our controls for COVID-19, okay? And this graph here basically is what's called the hierarchy of controls. In the safety and health profession, this is the main thing that we use when we look at any type of hazard control, okay? And a lot of, a lot of pitfalls that we, that we run into, you know, everybody runs into this, this type of pitfall is that, you know, I see a hazard and I'm automatically gonna put um, my people in respirators, just boom. You know, don't even think about it, just put them in masks or put them in respirators, okay? And that's not really the right way to think about it. The, the way to think about it is, is step through these hierarchy of controls. And as you can see at the bottom, or from top to bottom, we're going the most effective controls to the least effective controls, okay? So uh, elimination, uh, substitution, engineering, and administrative PPE, you know, elimination is the most effective control out there if we can simply eliminate it, okay? Um, you know, the next one down is, is substitution. Um, however, with COVID-19, we really can't substitute it for something else we're stuck with it, okay? Um, so we have to deal with it. So in that case, it's not really applicable. But we're gonna get into the specific examples of engineering, administrative, and PPE controls as we go on here. So as I mentioned, you know, um, elimination is a control for COVID-19. It's very effective um, at eliminating the exposure to the particular hazard. However, in most cases, it's not really that feasible, okay? You know, we all have to work, we all have to buy groceries, um, we all have to, you know, be part um, and, you know, do, you know, do our life, you know, do life, okay? We, can, we can't just all be stuck in a home and have everybody give us things, okay? So elimination, yes, is a, is a good control and isolate, being isolated is a good control for COVID-19. In a lot of cases, it's just not, it's not feasible, okay? So let's move on to the next one. Uh, engineering controls for COVID-19. In engineering control is basically something that we produce that controls a particular hazard without the human even being involved, okay? Whether it's a barrier or a guard or, or, or something like that, um, engineering controls are put in place that we really don't have to do anything as long as they're in place and the human can go ahead and do the job without worrying about the hazard, okay? Within the, COVID, within the context of COVID-19, some examples of this are high efficiency air filters. And so this is something that we can utilize uh, in our workplace, uh, specifically your HVAC system to improve the quality of the air. So what we mean by high efficiency basically is, is the, there's basically a, a, a tighter uh, context of woven fiber woven fabric in your air filters and that basically collects more air contaminants than a normal air filter would would do okay the upside is it collects more contaminants but the downside is it's going to be harder for your fan to work to pull air through that filter okay so there's a little bit of a trade-off there that you kind of got to think about um, increasing overall ventilation what we mean by this is is like dilution type ventilation. You're bringing more air in can be a control measure for COVID-19. Um, however, we have to be careful how we're placing our fans or if we're using cooling fans, we gotta be careful how we, we place those fans, okay? As an example, you know, if we're in, like in a, in a doctor's office, you know, we wouldn't want to have our fans blowing from the doctor's office where they're doing the procedures out to the reception area, okay? That's bringing all the contaminants out to people that don't need them, okay? So on the other hand, but if we, if we bring it the other way, if we if bring it from the, the clean air to the more contaminated air, we remove it right there, 
uh, we're going to be a lot better off. So you, so you got to be really careful and think about what's going on downstream if you utilize cooling fans. Um, installing physical barriers such as clear plastic sneeze guards are examples of um, engineering controls. And I'm going to show a, a good uh, graphic on this <clears throat> here in just a little bit. But if that physical barrier again is in place, then we really don't have to do a thing. We can continue our work uh, and do our jobs. Uh, installing drive-through windows also provides uh, some, some distance between ourselves or the, or the public and the worker. Okay, it's kind of built in with that. And then we can also utilize negative pressure rooms. And this is mainly used more in healthcare settings for really kind of um, toxic atmospheres or if you have a, a pretty bad um, bug or something that you're trying to get rid of, uh, they utilize negative pressure rooms. And, and the, the best way to describe this, what a negative pressure room is, is you know, if you've ever gone into a room and you kind of left the door open and as the ventilation system kicks on, it slams the door shut. Well, that particular room is under negative pressure at that, at that point. And that's kind of what you want is you want air to filter into that room and then be removed in some fashion. And the, the opposite of that is a positive pressure room. Like when you leave the door open and the air kicks on and it blows your, your door open, you can tell that's, that room is slightly um, under positive pressure. But the HVAC guys typically will try to, to, to get these two equalized so it's neither positive or negative. But if you're trying to get rid of a contaminant, a negative pressure room um, is what you want. Okay, that kind of covers some examples of some engineering controls. All right, this graphic was uh, made by the uh, Center for Disease Control, and it kind of illustrates a couple really good concepts um, as far as, you know, uh, administrative controls, which I'm gonna talk about, but also uh, engineering controls. So if you look at the top, what we have here is basically a conveyor line system going from your left to right, okay, and you've got four workers, you got two on each side, and then you have them less than six feet apart. So this is a bad situation here because not only they, you know, are less than six feet apart on their left to right, but, you know, front to back, there's also less than six feet, okay? But if you go down to the next tier, if we can just simply remove the two workers that are crossed the, um, the conveyor belt and then increase the distance between the two workers on the left and right, that's a lot better situation because we're maintaining that six feet of distance. And then on the third tier down there, if we simply just put a, a barrier between there, that will further increase the or decrease the possibility of transmission because not only do you have uh, six feet of distance, but you have a physical barrier there that's going to prevent anybody from being exposed between the two workers on your left and right. And then the best situation is that they're at the very bottom where you have not only have the partition, but then you have another partition going from your left and right, like a horizontal uh, partition. And then you can add those other two co coworkers in and you, from a producti productivity standpoint, you're back right back to where you were on the top example. Um, so the, again, these are just some examples of engineering controls that can be added to uh, prevent exposure to COVID-19. All right, moving on down to the tier, the next level is administrative controls. Again, they're not quite as effective as engineering controls, but still pretty good, you know, work pretty well. You know, a classic example of this is, is um, keeping workers at home, stopping face-to-face -face meetings, uh, starting tele teleworking, stop non-essential travel, um, working alternate work shifts, limit access to the workplace. Um, the state of Missouri has pretty much all those first ones that I just uh, talked about. We've started doing that probably since the middle part of March. Um, no touch trash cans <clears throat> and sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol requiring regular hand washing and posting hand washing signs 
in restrooms. All of these are examples of administrative controls. Continuing on with administrative controls, simply cuff, covering coughs and sneezes, uh, providing customers and the public with tissues and, and trash receptacles, uh, don't use another worker's phone or desk, and then establish routine cleaning with EPA approved disinfectants. With this last one here, um, you know, it, it could be kind of challenging to come up with, you know, your traditional types of, of cleaning products, that, you know, like your Lysol wipes or Clorox wipes and that sort of thing. But later on, I've got a resource link that I'm going to show you that you can go to this link and, and type in some sort of product name, and it'll show you if it's um, approved to disinfect COVID-19 or not. And I think it'll be a good alternative or you'll be able to see some alternative products that um, you can use if some of these other products are, are not uh, or you're, you're on limited supply. So um, I think that's a really good link and I'll show it to you here in just a little bit. Okay, so personal protective equipment. Okay, again, this is our last line of defense against a particular hazard because all of the responsibility is on the worker or on the user of that, okay? Um, it has to fit right. Uh, the employee has to store it correctly. They need to know how to use it. All the, you know, all these things come into play when we look at personal protective equipment. And up to some point, personal protective equipment will fail, okay? It will always fail. Unlike an engineering control where if we have an engineering control and at least it's properly maintained, it's probably going to do its job. But any type of personal protective equipment will fail at some point. Face coverings are not considered personal protective equipment, uh, mainly because they're they're meant to um, keep the, the whoever's wearing those. It's basically a, a, a an infection prevention type um, apparatus. Okay, whereas with a respirator, a respirator is basically designed um, to provide you clean breathing air. Okay, so it's, I know it's a little bit confusing that I, that I added face coverings in with personal protective equipment, but I did want to make that distinction that uh, face coverings are not considered personal protective equipment. Um, however, if you can't maintain that six feet of distance, um, you're going to need to wear some sort of uh, face coverings. And one thing to keep in mind about face coverings is that when we cough or when we sneeze, the size of those molecules or those droplets can range from like 0.5 microns to 50 microns. And we can't even see below 10 microns. Okay. So the face coverings, just because, just through their design, will probably do a, a decent job of filtering the bigger droplets when somebody coughs or sneezes, but they're not gonna get the really small things, okay? Not like an N95 respirator would do, okay? Um, if we do have N95 respirators, you know, not only is it gonna provide infection control, but it's also gonna provide uh, the user with clean breathing air, it's good protection, they design a N95 respirator to filter the hardest particle there is, which is a 0.3 micron particle, to filter that out for it to achieve its um, certification, its NIOSH certification. Um, but right now they're really hard to come by. You know, the, all the uh, medical establishments are, are using them. Um, but if you do use those, um, you, you might have to implement a respiratory protection program that's required under OSHA. So if you as an employer provide these respirators with the intent of protecting the health of your workers, you have to have a complete respiratory protection program. However, if, you, if, you, if an employee comes up to you and says, you know, I, I'd feel better if I just had one, and they wear one, they're using it voluntarily, then that cuts a lot of the requirements out as far as a, a 
complete respiratory protection program. At that point, you just have to have a copy of Appendix D of the standard, which basically just talks about, you know, you're wearing this respirator voluntarily, please, you know, take care of it. Don't, you know, don't store it in, in contaminated environments um, and, and that sort of thing. So we, you know, as an employer, you have to make those distinctions um, there. Uh, face shield is another example of personal protective equipment. It does a pretty good job. Um, obviously, it doesn't seal quite as good as like a, a normal respirator, but it can do the, can do a job in um, in helping to prevent infection. And um, as far as wearing gloves go, I don't think that's probably a good idea. And the reason for that is because you know if I'm an employee and I come in and work and I'm I'm wearing gloves and I never take those gloves off throughout the entire day, there's a good chance that I'm gonna be spreading the contaminant all through that work site. I think we're, we're much better off, um, you know, using hand sanitizer and consistently and constantly washing our hands as opposed to the possibility of spreading that virus. Now, if you're in a healthcare setting, you really have no choice. You, gotta, you have to wear gloves because uh, the possibility of contamination is, is, is imminent. And so there's a high likelihood you could get contaminated. So um, there's a distinction there, but um, you know, you know, people wearing gloves to the supermarket, just it's just not a good idea. So all right, so that kind of covers personal protective equipment. And again, that's our last line of defense or last means of control. Step four, we can look at screening of workers for COVID-19. And this is the CDC considers this an optional thing, you know, something that, um, you know, it's, it's totally optional. And this is where you're asking, you know, the workers that come in, have you had any COVID symptoms within the past 24 hours? Um, you might also be involved with, with temperature checks. However, I would caution that if you do temperature checks, um, both the person taking the temperature and the person that's getting checked both need to wear some sort of personal protective equipment. Okay, and we we've kind of been seeing some of that not not take place. You know, the the person <clears throat> um, taking the temperature may wear theirs, but the other person is not. So again, we're you know we're trying to uh, prevent contamination for each other. So both parties need to be wearing uh, some sort of personal protective equipment or, or a face covering to prevent contamination. And then if any employee answers yes about symptoms or they have a, a temperature, then they need to go home. Okay. Okay. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentations on, on COVID-19, um, there's general guidance, which I kind of just prov um, provided in the, in the previous slides that I just talked about, but there's more specific COVID guidance and they're coming out with new industries every day. So um, the list here is just an example of the specific guidance that OSHA and the CDC has put out. So if, if there's employers in any of these occupations, definitely go to the more specific guidance um, that will give you, uh, you know, exact guidance on what you, we need to follow and, and uh, kind of speaker language as far as um, industries go. Okay. Okay, this next graphic is called a, a decision tree. So basically what you can do is, is start on the left here and it probably it gives you some sort of framework on um, how you're gonna decide if you're ready to open up your business or not. You know, have you taken the appropriate safeguards? Okay, so uh, start on the left, kind of, it's kind of like a flow chart. You know, you answer the questions and then you go on. Um, if you answer yes, then you can move on to the next one. And if you answer yet, yes to that one, and then you can move on to the next one. And then um, it gives, gives you the indication that you're open and kind of monitor the situation of what's going on. So um, up there is the link to that tool. If anybody wants to, to access that tool, uh, I provided the link there for that. And then finally, step five, we want to ensure compliance with OSHA standards. So what I talked about earlier, you know, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're trying to <clears throat> control a particular hazard that kind of kicks us into other OSHA standards that we have to comply with. And, 
if we're using like goggles or gloves or um, face shields or anything like that, um, that could kick us into what's called a personal protective equipment program. And that standard is found under 29 CFR 1910-132. The main requirements of that particular standard is, is that you have to do a hazard assessment to determine what type of personal protective equipment you're gonna need. Okay, and that has to be signed off on by a supervisor. And then once the hazard assessment has been completed, then you have to do the training on that personal protective equipment. Where are you gonna store it? What's its life? You know, how are you gonna ensure that it's gonna fit, fit correctly? You know, all those things have to be covered in a personal protective equipment program. Uh, respiratory protection program, again, touched on that briefly. But if you provide your employees with an N95 respirators or N95 respirators and you tell that employee, you know, I want you to wear this, this is mandatory to protect your health, then you have to have a complete respiratory protection program. However, if you have um, or provide <clears throat> the employer or the, excuse me, the employee wants to wear this particular N95 respirator voluntarily, then you have to provide them a copy of Appendix D of the standard. And then again, face coverings are not considered respirators. Um, another standard that you might have to comply with now, if you're changing up your cleaning chemicals, is hazard communication, is the hazard communication standard, and that's under 29 CFR 1910-1200. So if you're adding any type of cleaning chemicals, that you didn't normally have, you need to be sure you have a safety data sheet on that particular chemical. And then you need to be sure those chemicals are appropriately labeled and that the employees have the training uh, for that particular type of chemical. Okay. And um, another really good place to go and that lists all these standards um, is OSHA's website, which is OSHA.gov. Uh, the easiest way to, to navigate the OSHA website is go to OSHA.gov, go in the upper right-hand corner, and go to the A to Z index. And um, to find these particular standards, what you'd want to do is, is click under S under standards and look for 1910 standards, which are general industry. If you're in the construction industry, then it'd be under 1926. Another component of OSHA guidance, or excuse me, OSHA um, compliance is uh, appropriate record keeping. So um, a lot of you may be familiar with OSHA's record keeping uh, guidelines, but if we have 11 or more employees, typically we have to maintain something that's called the OSHA 300 log. And this is a recordable case. So if we, if we have an accident, somebody cuts their finger, requires stitches, something like that, um, that may go on, that may, may be a recordable case that goes on the OSHA 300 log. For a COVID-19 case, we have to meet all three of this criteria. It has to be a confirmed case of COVID-19, it has to be work-related, and the case involves one or more of the general recording criteria set forth in 20, 29 CFR 1904.7, okay? which basically constitutes whether it's medical treatment or is it first aid, okay? So in other words, um, it kind of all depends upon the circumstances of the COVID-19 case, whether it's gonna belong on the OSHA 300 log or not, okay? Okay, to wrap things up here, um, some resources, again, that I put together. This first one is OSHA's publication on guidance on preparing work, workplaces for COVID-19. Um, it's a good, it's a good uh, publication. Uh, another good resource to have is Back to Work Safely from the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Um, previously, I talked about those lists of disinfectants. Uh, that is the, uh, the link that you can go to. You can click on that link and then you can actually do a keyword search. Uh, let's just you know do a search under pledge or something like that. That'll let you know if it's appropriate COVID disinfectant. And then if you have specific questions regarding the res OSHA's respiratory standard, the small entity compliance guide is also a really good one to, to have. And um, 
That's the link for that one. Okay, to review the objectives, hopefully everybody has a basic understanding now of the Missouri Onsite Safety and Health Consultation Program. Um, we're kind of familiar with the steps of an infectious disease preparedness plan that we need to have in place. Uh, know the steps we can take to reduce COVID-19 exposure. You hopefully learned about the hierarchy of controls and the importance of elimination, uh, engineering and administrative controls, and know that personal protective equipment is our least uh, favorable means of protection. And then finally, I think hopefully you, you've gained some understanding about, you know, if we're trying to um, prevent COVID-19 exposure, uh, what are some of the OSHA requirements that we, that we have to now um, comply with? So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Daniel. That was a phenomenal presentation. Let's see. We've got a question that came in over the chat. What is one misconception you would like to address for our external audience? OSHA, we're kind of in, in regards to OSHA mock inspections. Um, we constantly battle the problem of, you know, if, if we have, um, if we do a consultation, well, they'll just turn you into OSHA, okay? Uh, we constantly battle that, and that is not true. Uh, any employer who utilizes the program, their confidentiality is protected by federal law. So we cannot tell anybody uh, where we go when we do a consultation. That's probably one of the, the, the biggest misconceptions that we run into. And then we've got another one. Um, what are some of the easiestly, or easiest preventable violations? Oh, I think uh, some of the more preventable ones are labeling of containers. You know, I talked about uh, hazard communication, just keeping labels on containers. Um, if you put it into, you know, if you buy a container of something, let's say WD-40 from Walmart, and then you put it in a secondary container, make sure that secondary container is, um, is labeled with at least the identity of the chemical and the appropriate hazard warning. Uh, a lot of times we, we also see a lot of electrical type um, violations where, you know, on outlets, outlets simply don't have face plates. And it's not uncommon that I see a violation for um, a face plate missing on an electrical box that cost an employer, you know, $3,500 for a 79 cent faceplate. Okay. Um, so watch your use of extension cords as well. Um, extension cords are meant for, um, you know, a lot of times employers will use those in lieu of permanent wiring and they're not, they're not really designed for that. Or they're, they have a broken ground pin on them or the cord is, it's got a bad nick in it. Um, and if you have a, a cord with a bad neck in it, you just basically need to replace that cord. So, um, so those are just some examples of, of easy to fix sort of things that, that OSHA will, can, can nail an employer on and, and it's so unnecessary, so. Okay, thank you. And then what rights do employees have in response to COVID concerns and what does the process look like for filing those concerns? Um, I'm not really, um, I'm, I'm not really an expert on the, the, the different types of rights on that. Now, um, you know, if, it, if an employee believes that there is a, a legitimate safety problem or a safety concern related to COVID-19, what they can do is uh, file a formal complaint with OSHA and OSHA will go out and address that complaint. Thank you. And then do you have any success stories where programs have really made a difference for employees and employers? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention was co something called the, the SHARP program or Safety and Health Achievement Recognition Program. And this program is, is designed for companies who have excellent safety and health management systems. They can get up to uh, a three-year exemption from OSHA inspections. 
And a lot of times what happens is, you know, we will go in and we'll see some things that need to be fixed. You know, they're, they're having a problem with injuries and illnesses. They implement a safety and health management system in place. And then things really start to improve. Uh, they get the employees involved. And then we, we, we identify them as a good candidate for SHARP. They get in the program and just because of their, their implementation of a good safety and health management system, which is what SHARP requires, they continue to, to enjoy the benefits of reduced injuries and illnesses. Um, out of 120,000 small businesses in the state of Missouri, uh, there's only 30, around 30 companies right now in SHARP. So it's truly an elite group. Very cool. And then if a company reaches out to you for a mock inspection, how long does it take to be on site for that inspection typically? How, how long does it take to get there or how long is the consultation? Um, I think how long does it take to kind of get that schedule? Do you need to schedule that a few months out in advance or? Yeah, usually about a month or two. I know on the Kansas City side, um, we, are, we are doing great. I mean, we could get to you right away on the Kansas City side, on the St. Louis side, we're, we have probably about a month or two backlog on the, on the St. Louis side. So it kind of all depends upon the, on the, uh, the part of the state, but really on the Kansas City side, we can get to the employers right away. Okay, that's great. And then do you have any examples of, um, or what are your most impactful examples um, for building trades and manufacturing? For, for the building trades and manufacturing sectors. Okay, can you say that again? I'm sorry. Uh, what are the most impactful examples that you have for the building trades and manufacturing sectors? Um, well, I know that, you know, a lot of uh, facilities that we go into, um, you know, they will, they'll, if they have a union shop there, you know, we always include um, the, the union representative when we come in and, and do a visit. Um, so, you know, it's always good to, to hear. You know, I, I think a lot of times that the, um, the unions are really preaching safety and health, but I think it's always good to hear it from a, from a third party. So I think that kind of helps the trades out sometimes is to, to hear, you know, reinforce what the unions might be um, trying to implement in a respective company. Okay. And then are, are you doing mock inspections specifically related to COVID-19 concerns or are all the mock inspections comprehensive? No, um, the employer sets the scope of the visit. Okay, so, um, when they, when they, they come, the, the employer will complete an application and um, they will indicate on that application what they would like uh, for us to do. So if they just want us to look at COVID type situations, that would be a limited service visit. And they would only be held responsible for the hazards associated with that, that limited scope of the visit, okay? However, if they wanted to, us to look from a comprehensive standpoint, they, you know, they the technical term is like a wall to wall. Um, if they wanted us to look at everything, um, they would just indicate, you know, a full service visit. And we would look at, you know, we would do a complete walkthrough of the workplace, identifying hazards. And then we would also be looking at um, written safety and health programs that was required you have. I touched on some of those like a, um, a personal protective equipment plan or respiratory protection or hazard communication. Those are just some examples of that. So again, the employer always sets the scope of the visit. So we're gonna do whatever the employer would like us to do. Okay, okay, great. And then um, is it costly for companies to implement safety and health practices under SHARP? Or in, and then a follow-up to that is, are there funding sources available to help businesses that want to implement a SHARP program? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, the, the worst thing about Sharp, to be honest with you, is the paperwork, you know, making sure that, um, when you develop a safety and health management system, <clears throat> you you have to do some things like, uh, 
job hazard analysis and, and uh, review of, of written programs and, and um, preventive maintenance schedules and, and you know all that sort of thing. And that, a lot of that takes time and some, some added paperwork. Um, there are some situations where um, you, know, you may have to incur some, some costs um, but you probably have to, if you were involved in a normal consultation, you'd have to fix those things anyway. Um, but you know, what I hear from employers, you know, the, the, and I'm, again, I'm just being really honest with it. It's just the, the, the paperwork side of it. But once you get the, the paperwork side of it done and, um, once you have that part done, then everything's you just, you just have to maintain it at that point. And one thing I also want to throw out there too is that we we have a, a safety and health management system course that we put on four times a year. We put it on in Jefferson City. It's free. Uh, it runs from nine nine to three thirty in the afternoon, and we basically step you through the, the the incremental steps on how to develop a safety and health management system, and to to get in compliance with OSHA. Um, so that's just a, another option. If anybody's interested, you know, just contact us and, and um, we'll put you on the next offering of that. Uh, we had to cancel this month's offering because of COVID-19, but um, we hope to start those up. I think the next one's maybe in August, something like that. Okay. Okay, perfect. Well, um, unless we get some other questions from um, from Facebook, I think we can conclude, but I want to thank you for an outstanding presentation and your time and expertise and of course collaboration and opportunity to, to highlight all the good work you're doing in this space. I know that it's um, it just um, as important as ever right now. So really, really appreciate your uh, willingness to share with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So with that, I think we will conclude. And of course, if there's any follow-up questions that we haven't covered, um, I'm sure you can leave those on the on our Facebook page or in the chat, and we can reach out to reach out to Daniel again. So with that, I think we can 